Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so we start the fourth lecture in which we discuss uh, some concepts regarding static lift. It is important to discuss these concepts because uh, we normally hear and read more about the dynamic lift generation, wherein you need a relative velocity between the fluid and the body. But as you know in LTS systems, the static lift is generated even when they are stationary. So, if I ask this question about uh, how are LTA systems different from normal systems or what are LTA systems, uh, what would be the basic uh, quick answer? Yes? See, we, we need to follow a protocol in which you raise hands and then I get to choose. Everyone likes choice, isn't it? You have chosen this course as an elective. So, it is better that you raise your hands when I ask a question. Okay, so, we will start once again. If somebody asks you a question, what are lighter than air systems, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Anybody would like to answer? The first thing that comes to your mind, which is a, di a differentiating factor? Yes? Lift generation so, what is so different? Correct. Correct, correct. So, the principal lifting force in case of LTS systems is buoyancy. That is the main difference. The heavier than air systems also have some buoyancy, but the magnitude is very small and negligible. Okay. So, you know, we have studied in school about buoyancy and these are some pictures. Uh, basically, it is a tendency of a body to float or to rise when submerged in a fluid and when that happens, we know that uh, there is a force that is acting on the body. So, this particular principle was given to us by Archimedes. So, we call him as the genesis of buoyancy. Archimedes was a very famous mathematician. He has done many things other than just buoyancy. He has given many different uh, solutions to us. So, one of the questions I want people to answer in Moodle is, apart from buoyancy, what is the contribution of Archimedes? Okay, I noticed that only a few people are active on Moodle. I would urge all of you to start using Moodle as an effective tool for interaction. Now, that does not mean that you start logging into Moodle and uploading any junk that comes in your mind. We are not going to look at numbers. We are going to look at quality. So, we are going to look at how well you put your uh, points on Moodle. There are some basic uh, guidelines. First of all, anything that you put on Moodle, uh, try to ensure that the source of that is also included. You will notice below every picture, below every material that I borrow from somewhere, I always put some source. So, that protocol we need to follow even on Moodle page. We are not looking for your opinion or your thoughts on Moodle unless we ask you that specific question. We are looking for information. Second thing is going to Wikipedia and downloading material from there and putting it on Moodle is useful. I also use Wikipedia a lot, but that is only a starting point. That is not the ending point. So, go for material which is more detailed, more specific. Try to put material which adds to our knowledge, not something that just replicates. So, if you start using Moodle just for using sake, then it will go detrimental against you. It is better that you apply your mind, post interesting material, search for photos, videos which are illustrating the concept very well. Much of the content that you see has come by intelligent search by my students. So, every year, the, but the beauty of PowerPoint is you can always update it, you can always change it. So, that is why I use PowerPoint. It is easy for me to go to the blackboard and derive the things. I use PowerPoint because it allows me to dynamically alter the contents every year to make it more interesting, to bring in some new concepts, etcetera. So, help me. 
when you post material on moodle you help me in making the course more interesting you help in clarifying the concepts to others and also you help in enriching the course so this is what happened to our friend archimedes when he was having a shower during the bath he realized that when he goes inside the bath tub some water spills out and he figured out that a body will float only if the mass of the fluid displaced will be more than the weight of the body that is floating so he gave us the archimedes principle which says let us consider a body which is either in fully submerged condition or in partly partially submerged condition it applies to both uh, the fluid exerts an upward force on the body and this force is distributed roughly uniformly at all the points where the fluid touches the body okay and this force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced and this particular um, principle applies to not only bodies immersed in fluids but also fluids immersed in fluids and oil droplets submerged in water or in some other fluids so now i would like to ask you to again use the moodle page to give us examples of buoyancy in which there is a fluid submerged in a fluid those examples are not very easy to come by so i'd like you to go and search fluids within fluids how does the buoyancy act and if there is any interesting example or application of this particular principle of action of buoyancy of fluids on fluids let's see how we can verify this principle through a small school experiment so you can take a spring balance and on that spring balance you can load a small object such as a stone shown in this figure and you can see the reading so for instance the reading in this case is 0.67 newtons so that means the weight of the stone is 0.67 newtons now you take a beaker fill it with water in such a way that the level of the fluid is just below the spill point or below the spilling nozzle such a can is called as a eureka can probably to commemorate archimedes and his eureka moment i don't know but uh, it's called as a eureka can right so that means now what will happen is the moment fluid is displaced all the fluid will come out of this uh, nozzle and fall below so what you do is you take our stone and now submerge this stone inside this particular uh, can obviously some fluid will spill and there will be a reading on the spring balance so the reading of 0.67 now shows 0.40 assuming no other forces acting on the stone can we assume that the vertical buoyancy acting on it or the buoyancy force acting on it is the difference between the two okay now to verify that you take a beaker on a weighing balance take the reading of the empty beaker and take the reading of the beaker with the spilled water or the displaced water so if the reading was 0.1 the beaker becomes 0.37 so it shows that if the beaker weight is 0.1 0.37 means the difference is 0.27 and that matches exactly with so this experiment we have done in school i remember incidentally i went to my school day before yesterday i was just traveling and i just went to my school i met the principal and i remember actually i remember this experiment done in the science laboratory so then i thought let me recreate the experiment here in the classroom through a small animated sequence we have all studied this in school so we know but what can you learn more about this so what is this 0.27 is this the weight of the stone yes loss in weight of the stone so what can we learn about uh, the stone from this experiment volume volume of stone how much is the volume of stone the volume that we got in the uh, beaker that is true if the density of the stone and the fluid is same the volumes will match if the density matches volume of the volume of the stone is equal to the volume of the water in the correct so you are right the volume of the stone is equal to the volume of the water displaced so if you want to calculate the stone volume you can work out from this 
What about the red of the stone? Because we have taken a re reading. Okay, fine. So I'm just trying to see if you are attentive because it's early in the morning from IIT students at 11. Right now, uh, gases which are lighter than air, they are all candidates for the LTS systems. And this table tries to summarize the data, important data regarding these uh, gases. So, top of the list is hydrogen, the most preferred LTA gas. If you can live with its highly combustible and explosive nature. So, this particular gas as you can see under the NTP conditions, it has uh, a lifting capacity of around 1.1, 1.135 kilograms per meter cube, which means if you take, if you take a device or a balloon or any other uh, container, you put 1 meter cube of hydrogen in that, the vertical force acting on it will be 1.135 kg. This lifting capacity reduces as we go below. For helium, it becomes approximately 1 kg per meter cube. So, the ballpark in your mind should be that the lifting capacity of helium is approximately 1 kg per meter cube. Down the list, you get, you get gases like methane, ammonia, water vapor, acetylene, carbon monoxide. So, carbon monoxide, which is present in the exhaust of most automobiles, is also an LTA gas a candidate LTA gas, but the lifting capacity is so, so small that for it to be of any actual use is very limited. I mean, it can hardly be of any use to anybody. Okay. What about hot air? So, let us look at demonstration. Let us have a look at the demonstration of the power of hot air. So, what we have done is <coughs> we have um, uh, tried to uh, set up an experiment using uh, the items available. So, this is the standard toaster that uh, is present and uh, this is a standard uh, bin bag. So, what we have done is we have just kept this uh, bin bag over a toaster and we have switched it on. Very soon hot air currents will be, because there is no bread inside. So, hot air currents will start flowing uh, and start filling the envelope. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> the air inside, because it is heavier than the gas, than the hot air is automatically, I can feel it, it automatically coming out. So, it is displacing the cold air by the hot air generated. Okay. And then a time will come when the amount of hot air will be sufficient to generate the lifting force enough to lift this particular uh, balloon. So, we need to wait, it takes time. Remember, this room is air conditioned. So, the same experiment if you do in some other room you will find there is a difference in the timing. Now, observe very carefully because you are going to do an assignment of the same type very soon. So, it is important that you pay attention and look what is happening. So, I think the envelope is getting yeah. filled up because you can see it is slowly acquiring the inflated shape. It was uh, in the folded condition when it was put. Now, it is acquiring an inflated shape. So, we need to see. Uh, so, it is designed to switch off when there is uh, no bread inside uh, for a long time. Okay. So, that is why it is uh, generating uh, hot currents, but switching off subsequently.
So, what he is doing is he is trying to test the buoyancy level because by experimentation he knows at under what condition uh, there is enough buoyancy for it to hit the ceiling. Our target is if possible we want to hit the ceiling of this room. Okay. It is not easy, you can try it. It is not very easy to generate so much uh, buoyancy using just hot air to travel this distance because as soon as it goes up hot air will start coming in and that will change the temperature uh, of the gas inside and hence its buoyancy. There you go, see it starts turning and it starts falling. Okay. So, round of applause for our friends <laughs> for a nice demonstration about buoyancy.